Welcome everyone. I'm John Hopper, president of the Fibromyalgia Cancer Foundation, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to tonight's webinar, hosted in collaboration with Target Cancer Foundation and the Angiosarcoma Awareness. This is the first in a series of webinars exploring how precision medicine is being applied to rare cancers with a goal of developing targeted therapies. Our next webinar will be September 28th for your calendar with more specifics being posted on our website in the near future. Tonight's webinar focuses on the application of gene sequence based precision medicine and the special challenges that must be overcome to improve treatment efficacy for rare cancers. Please feel free to ask questions. Simply use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. So we have three distinguished panelists tonight. The first is Dr. Rizal Kozrak, is Associate Director of the Cancer Center for Medical College of Wisconsin. Dr. Kozrak served previously at the University of San Diego, California San Diego, the Morris Cancer Center, and at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She has extensive experience in personalized cancer therapy and innovative clinical trials. Rosell has published almost 900 peer review articles and has been the principal investigator of numerous grants and funding awards totaling over $100 million. She founded a rare tumor clinic at the University of California, San Diego, heads the Early Therapeutics of Rare Cancers Committee for the NCI Cooperative Group SWAG, and has founded a precision medicine and rare cancers clinic at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Ray is a principal investigator of Target Cancer Foundation's TRAC study, which stands for Target Rare Cancer Knowledge for Precision Medicine of Rare Cancers. Our next panelist is Jim Palma, who's the executive director of the Target Cancer Foundation. Over the past decade, Jim has grown Target Cancer into a nationally recognized foundation supporting comprehensive research programs and patient support services for rare cancer. Jim is a member of the Board of Directors of the National Organization of Rare Disorders and is a founding co-chair of the Rare Cancers Coalition. In addition, Jim is a founding member of the GI Cancers Alliance and the Global Cholangiocarcinoma Alliance. Our third panelist is Dr. Corey Painter, an Associate Director of Operations and Scientific Outreach for the Broad Institute Cancer Program and MIT Harvard Collaboration. Dr. Painter also leads the Angiosarcoma Project, a nationwide direct-to-patient initiative aimed at generating the genomic landscape of this orphan disease. This project also helps build scientific resources to enable broad-scale rare cancer research across many indications. A trained cancer researcher with a PhD in biochemistry, Dr. Painter serves as the Associate Director of the Count Me In program, which launches patient-driven research projects across multiple cancers. Corey is also a rare cancer survivor, so she brings a personal perspective to addressing unmet needs for these diseases. Tonight's moderator is our own Dr. Mark Firth, the scientific director for our foundation. Prior to joining us, Mark led programs in translational research and technology development at the Wake Forest School of Medicine and has a broad experience in both major academic institutions and the biopharmaceutical industry. Mark, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, John, and it's just a great pleasure to have such a fantastic panel to talk about something about, I know all of us are passionate about, which is the application of modern molecular biology and molecular genetics to treating cancer and to treating cancer increasingly in a personalized way and to include within that people with rare cancers who are actually a significant fraction of that total cancer population. The area in which um, we're talking about, in many respects, began quite a long time ago, 40, 45 years ago, with the first really strong recognition that cancer is a genetic disease. Not in, not in the sense of necessarily being inherited from parents to children, although there are some examples where mutations are passed on that way, but more that as cells are growing and dividing in the body, they can accumulate mutations which ultimately turn them into cancer cells. And the idea that that was a very fundamental aspect of cancer and that it might be a treatable aspect of cancer, the basis for creating new approaches to treatment that address the underlying root cause at the molecular level or the genetic level 
was something we began dreaming about 40 years ago or 45 years ago. It really began to happen 20 or 25 years ago, more or less in coincidence with the incredible increase in the ability to sequence DNA and the first um, complete sequence of a human genome, which in those years was a major project involving tens of laboratories and hundreds of millions of dollars. Today, a human genome can be sequenced for a couple of thousand dollars. So there's been incredible progress in parallel that's enabled the universe that we're going to talk about today, which is precision cancer medicine. And with that, let me, let me turn the floor for a while to Jim Palma to talk about his foundation and the way they're mobilizing this state-of-the-art approach to bring it to people with rare cancers. Jim? Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to everybody for having me here today. It's really a pleasure to be a part of this webinar. Um, I am extraordinarily fortunate to get to work with uh, everybody who's on this webinar uh, on almost a daily basis, so I I'm really grateful to have the chance to be a part of this as well. Um, as Mark and John said, uh, my name is Jim Palma. I'm the Executive Director of Target Cancer Foundation, and I was just going to give a little bit of background in our foundation and how, how we fit into the conversation here. Um, so we, we, like many foundations focused on things like rare diseases and rare cancers, we were founded by a patient who was my brother-in-law, Paul. Um, and Paul was diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma when he was 37. And for those who don't know, cholangiocarcinoma is a rare cancer of the liver that affects just under 10,000 people per year. But like many rare cancers, it suffers from a real lack of treatments. Uh, and certainly at the time when he was diagnosed, a lack of research. Um, so he started the foundation himself in an effort to drive research funding towards rare cancers like the one that he had in an effort to, to make some progress in these diseases. Um, 13 years later, we're still doing this work, uh, and certainly we've grown from that time. Um, Paul passed away in 2009, but we wanted to keep the work that he started moving forward. Um, and we've done a lot of different things in this world, uh, and certainly much of it in collaboration with Corey and John and Dr. Kurzrock and so many different great collaborators uh, that we're so fortunate to work with. Um, <clears throat> but what I wanted to do in, in just starting us off today was lay the groundwork a little bit by focusing on some of the challenge challenges that we see as we work with the rare cancer patient community that are so consistent. There's many, many different types of rare cancers. Some of them affect 10 people a year, some affect 15, 20,000 people a year, but the challenges that patients face are very consistent. Um, and, and I know that there are uh, many patients watching tonight, so I know that much of this is probably very familiar. Um, so we know from working with this community that um, patients often experience a delayed or an in incorrect diagnosis. Uh, we know that many patients are working with physicians who have a lack of expertise uh, in their rare cancer, and it may be that uh, a doctor has never seen the type of rare cancer before uh, when they're treating that patient. Um, there's often no standard of care uh, or, or a real established standard of care for a particular type of rare cancer, which may lead to treatments adapted from other similar cancers. Um, there's certainly a lack of clinical trials um, and, and, and rare cancers, um, unlike more common cancers, um, clinical trials can often offer a, a, a best opportunity for successful treatment. So it's so important that, that these trials are available. Um, many times rare cancers are left behind as, as uh, drug approvals favor um, bigger patient populations and more common cancers. Um, and there's, of course, a feeling of isolation. Um, you know, we know that for more common types of cancers, there may be awareness months and branding campaigns and, and, and all of these really wonderful things that help people um, feel like they're part of a community. Um, but often in rare cancers, that may not be the case, but it's certainly a place where an organization like the Fibrola Miller Cancer Foundation really fills the gap by bringing patients together and helping them um, sort of work together and, and find each other um, for help as they go through uh, diagnosis and treatment. But one of, one of the most important issues, in my opinion, that's emerged recently and one that we've really turned our attention to as a foundation um, is a lack of access to uh, an awareness of biomarker testing. Um, and, and biomarker testing goes by many different names. Uh, you may have heard comprehensive genomic profiling or next generation sequencing or molecular profiling, um, many, many different names, uh, but mostly referring to the same process 
um, of testing tumor tissue or blood to identify mutations or fusions that might be driving somebody's cancer. And as a result, identifying treatments to target those mutations or fusions um, as a way of treating cancer, and hopefully as a way that comes with less side effects than chemotherapy. Um, I'm going to let the uh, the experts on the call speak more to this um, rather than trying to do it myself, except to say that as a foundation, we see every day that patients um, either aren't told about this testing um, or maybe their insurance company doesn't reimburse it. So they don't, they don't pursue it. Um, so we're, we're working very hard to make sure that everybody has access. Um, and one of the ways that we're doing that is by running a clinical trial called TRAC. Um, uh, and one of the central parts of that trial is that patients with rare cancers who enroll uh, receive this testing at no cost. Um, so I'll be happy to talk more about that trial. I think Dr. Dr. Krizrak might be speaking about it a little bit as well. Um, but but that's that's our background. And, and really, as, as I think about these challenges and as I think about what we as a foundation are trying to do, it, it really does point towards precision medicine as a way to, to really effectively start to think about rare cancers where treatments are otherwise lacking. So this is a perfect topic and one that um, I, I know this panel, will, uh, it'll be a great discussion. So, so thank you again for having me and happy to weigh in as we go along. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, I want to remind folks who are listening in that the Q&A function is already open. If you have questions, please enter them as soon as you like. And we'll try to at least keep an eye on that and, and maybe even begin to address questions during the time. But we'll also be sure to pick up it towards the end um, if there are questions that haven't already been addressed. Um, with that, I'd like to turn to Ray Kurzrock, uh, who, frankly, I, I've known for years, and she's been one of the clinicians in the oncology space who I've just admired for a very long time as someone who's highly innovative. and. I've learned over the last few years that she's also paid very special attention to people with rare cancers and, as Jim was talking about, to bring the most modern technologies to bear on tumors which may only be diagnosed in tens to a few hundreds of people or, or perhaps you know a few thousand people a year in the United States. And Ray, let me ask you, um, we, we began together in a world where we talked about lung cancer, we talked about pancreatic cancer, everything was by organ. It was kind of one size fits all for a tumor of a given organ. And clinical trials, you know, were maybe there were two kinds of lung cancer, two kinds of leukemia, and so on. Um, the world we're in now is very different. Maybe you could talk about that and the impact of, of turning to a different definition of cancer that really begins with the underpinnings at the genetic level. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, with um, uh, people that are passionate about this area. And um, I think that uh, what's happened um, in the last 10 to 15 years in cancer um, is, is really transformative. And we've started down a whole new road about thinking about cancer. Uh, we're, we're still traveling that road. We, we haven't yet reached our destination, but, but we can see where we're going now. So um, cancer was originally classified and is still classified by the site of origin. So if your cancer starts in the lung, uh, it's a lung cancer, starts in the colon, it's a colon cancer. And uh, the way we classified cancer was we looked under the light microscope, which was invented about 500 years ago. And it's a phenomenal instrument. Um, and we looked at the surface of the cell and we could say, oh, from the surface, that looks like it came from the lung. And from the surface, that looks like it came from the breast. And then um, with rare cancers, uh, that was really a problem because they they were unusual cancers. So we could do these clinical trials in lung cancer or breast cancer, but there weren't very many patients um, in order to look carefully at clinical trials of rare cancer. So um, the rare cancers were are individually rare, but when you put them together, they're a huge unmet need 
because they're 25% of the cancer burden. And, um, but, the, but then we began to realize once we had the tools to do genomic sequencing, um, that um, this looking at the surface of the cell was telling a very superficial story. It was telling us where the cancer came from, but it didn't tell us what was wrong with the cancer. And then all of a sudden we had uh, sequencing. Now um, to remind everybody in the 1990s, um, it was felt that uh, the human genome would never be sequenced. It was just too complicated. And then around 2001 never was over uh, because the human genome was sequenced, but it cost $3 billion to sequence a human genome. By around 2007, uh, the price had dropped $100 million, which is kind of still steep for insurance. Uh, but now, um, you know, we can sequence a human genome for a couple of thousand dollars. So that meant that we can do it in the clinic um, every day on patients. And, um, and now we can look into the cell, not just on the surface of the cell, but look into the cell's DNA, which is really the code for life, and see where the mistakes are. And those mistakes are what causes the cancer. So now we know not where the cell, the tumor came from, but we know exactly what is wrong with the tumor. And um, uh, people have been developing drugs that specifically target those abnormalities and try to reverse them. So this is a really a whole new era. And in a way, um, it's um, even though rare cancers are a huge unmet need, um, they be, they're almost paving the way um, for doing this type of um, new way of doing oncology. And the reason for that is because there wasn't that much in treatment available for them. So you're almost forced to find a new path. And to me, the new path is doing the sequencing. And of course, we have many powerful tools uh, beyond genomic sequencing. We can look at the immune environment. Um, we can look at the RNA. But now we have these new tools. We can figure out exactly what is wrong in every patient's tumor. Science isn't perfect, but it's pretty powerful at this point. And then we can try to customize a therapy for what is wrong with that patient. Again, I don't want to overhype it. We don't know everything, but um, the change in the last decade is, um, is breathtaking. So I'm going to pause there. Thanks, Ray. I, I'll pick up on that just for a moment. Um, for those who may not have even been around at that point, the sea change that I certainly saw from a, a personal level came with the recognition of a very specific molecular change in a rare leukemia called CML or chronic myeloid leukemia, which people who looked down the microscope and looked at chromosomes had recognized back around 1970 had a funny chromosome in every case in, in the leukemic cells in the bone marrow. Fast forward to the period around early 19 or mid 1980s, and some of the molecular tools we're talking about were just coming into play. And it became clear that that funny chromosome actually was responsible for the creation of what we now would call the driver of that leukemia, a genetic mutation that created an altered protein, happened to be an altered protein kinase, and it happened to be one that arose from two genes being fused together to make a protein that was a chimera, part of it coming from protein A, part of it coming from protein B. And that was present in every case of this cancer, and people did a lot of lab research to show it actually caused that cancer. And then you go ahead to somewhere in the 90s, and some scientists 
in the pharmaceutical industry began to make inhibitors of that protein kinase, a new class of drug entirely, and certainly one that nobody back when we were starting out to study cancer would have ever dreamed of as a cancer therapy. And within a relatively short period of time, when that began to be given to patients, it didn't completely cure them. People take that drug for the rest of their lives, but they do live out a, essentially a normal lifespan cancer-free, a very high percentage of those patients. And it's really that kind of precision in diagnosis and treatment that became sort of the poster child for those of us who had been dreaming that the genetic understanding would actually make a difference for patients. Having said that, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to Corey for a moment, or ask Corey to speak for a moment, as a cancer patient who's become very passionate about this kind of approach, and somebody who's also a first-rate scientist. So you can bridge those two audiences very well. And maybe you could talk just a bit about your experience and where we are now with being able to take those kinds of tools and the promise that we, we all felt in a very real sense from CML into many other rare cancers. Yeah, thank you for the question. And thank you to my fellow panelists and for everybody um, who's involved with organizing this important um, discussion. Um, I am a scientist, but I, and I was a scientist before I was diagnosed with a very rare cancer called angiosarcoma. And um, this was about 12 years ago when I was diagnosed. So I, I knew enough to understand it was really bad. And I knew enough to be able to read everything that had ever been published on this very rare disease. And I knew enough to just basically um, have an existential crisis because there was almost nothing known. I was likely gonna die from it before I could do anything to help anybody else that was ever gonna walk down that dark path. So it was a, a pretty devastating um, time in my life. And I think it compounded because I am a scientist and understood just kind of how hopeless it was at that moment in, in time. Um, when you are faced with a rare cancer and you're looking for information and data uh, and there isn't anything there, it's, it, it really is pretty tragic. And, you know, 12 years ago, we were, there, there was genomic sequencing that was not main mainstay. So it was not recommended to me to have my tumors, my tumor sequenced. And my doctors didn't have any data to point um, in any direction whatsoever. So in common cancers, though there may not be precision in what they do, they at least have what's called a standard of care, meaning they've seen enough patients and run enough trials to have a sense of what they're actually supposed to do when a patient comes in with a breast cancer or a prostate cancer, or lung cancer. Um, but sometimes, oftentimes when you have a very rare cancer like me, angiosarcoma that only gets 300 people a year, they just have no data at all. And, and my doctor looked at me and said, we don't know, but if you want to look at your children and say, you tried something, here you go. And he took a pencil and wrote a bunch of different types of chemotherapies and combinations of chemotherapies. And he handed this piece of paper to me that I still have tucked far in the recesses of my house as a reminder of how far we've come and said, just pick one. And, um, and I said, just pick one. And he said, yeah, I mean, your guess is as good as ours. And when you receive that uh, as a cancer patient, it does not inspire you with a lot of hope at all. And, um, you know, when you're a parent, my kids were two and four at the time. So of course I'm going to try anything. They, they could have said, you know, stand upside down next to a flagpole for 12 hours. And I'd be like, I'm there. Um, and so I chose just uh, a combination of gemcitabine and, a, and, um, and a taxol, like a, a, a braxane. And I was networking with a bunch of clinicians at the time, bouncing between, you know, Harvard and Memorial Sloan Kettering and trying to talk to as many sarcoma specialists as I could find. And I came to the consensus through all of them that because there's no data, then there's no data to suggest anything was going to help. And the only guarantee was that if I stayed the course, I was going to rack up a bunch of side effects and neuropathy and, and have no idea if I was actually doing anything right. And so I decided to, you know, do enough chemo to be bald. And, um, and I had surgery, I had a mastectomy, my tumor was in my breast. And uh, then they just, they just would do a bunch of scans every three months and watch every single one of us, by the way, <laughs> little known fact, if you don't have cancer, if you go get a CT scan, like a full body scan, stuff will pop up. You will have things that are not normal in your body. 
And so when you have a rare cancer and nobody has any idea what they're even looking at on the films, every one of those weird things that popped up could have been a tumor, you know, because my tumor is a, is vascular in nature. And a lot of these weird things that pop up in people's normal bodies are called atypical vascular malformations. And so here I am rare vascular tumor with this uh, body dispersed with vascular events that they couldn't quite describe. And they were too small to biopsy. And even if they could biopsy them, who knows what they would find on the slides. And so it was a bunch of stuff. Don't know how to treat you. We're going to keep scanning you every three months and just kind of see if they grow. Goodbye. You know, and that was, that was what life was like without precision medicine uh, 12 years ago. And so you can imagine how, um, how empowering it would be to be handed such a devastating diagnosis, but then afterwards, like, and here's a little ray of hope, even though we know it might not cure you, you may extend your life a little bit and, and you have, you have a direction. And when you are on the receiving end of a diagnosis, that, um, that feeling that you're out on a ledge without a path to take any step in any direction is paralyzing. And so even if you have any information, any testing that gives you a ray of hope, it's so much, um, you can hang so much there that it can allow you to take a deep enough breath to take a step in the right direction. So that's a patient perspective. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Um, and you, you're telling that with a smile, but only I think because you've survived a lot of years of uncertainty and, you know, kudos to your courage in facing it. Ray, when a patient like Corey with a rare cancer comes to your rare cancer clinic today, what's different from what she faced 12 years ago? How do you deal with it now? Um, so I think it's a really completely different world. Uh, what Corey expressed, um, which is true for rare cancers, it's actually true for common cancers too. Um, until we had uh, sequencing, uh, genomic sequencing, and um, uh, we were, were guessing. Uh, it, and, and what Corey described, um, it was really guessing because there wasn't even um, clinical trials to guess from. It was just, you know, we're going to put together a couple of drugs and, you know, Corey hit the jackpot. She got the curative combination, um, but it's, it's a guess. And, and, and that's what we did for patients with all cancers. There might've been a clinical trial that shows that 35% of patients respond, um, but we had no idea which 35%. Um, and which were the 65% that would gain no benefit and just toxicity um, from the drug. Uh, today, when a patient walks into my clinic, um, we do all this sequencing, all this biomarker testing, all this immune testing, and then we know what is precisely wrong with their tumor. And um, I don't care what's wrong with another thousand people with the same tumor. I just care about them as an individual. And what we're learning is that every tumor is different, just like every person is different. You know, each of us look different, we're different heights. Every tumor is different. So we can figure out exactly what is wrong with the tumor now. And that puts us on the road to being able to treat that tumor, to personalize the therapy and treat it precisely. Now, do we know how to do this perfectly? No, because the, the, what we find is what is wrong with tumors is often complicated, often may require more than one drug, or some of the abnormalities may not have a drug or drugs that work against them yet. But on the other hand, we have so much information that we couldn't even imagine this information 15 or even 10 years ago. And now we can get that information every day in the clinic. And for some patients, it's absolutely transformative. We can target what's wrong with their tumor and um, you know, save their lives. Now, again, I don't want to overhype it. We can't do this perfectly for everybody. But I really think um, 
we're on the road. Um, and you gave the example of chronic myelogenous leukemia. That is such a great example. Um, so um, when I was young, uh, faculty member, fellow, um, chronic myelogenous leukemia was a death sentence. Everybody died in three or four years. There was no reprieve, 100% death. Now, by understanding the precise genomic abnormality in that uh, leukemia and having drugs that can target it and starting treatment right at diagnosis, not waiting, but right at the time of diagnosis, uh, patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia have a normal life expectancy. And it's kind of amazing because um, just before I left UCSD, there was a lecture at um, for the fellows on, on chronic myelogenous leukemia, and I made some comment. And two fellows came up to me afterwards and said, well, I don't think your comment is applicable because uh, chronic my CML, which is chronic myelogenous leukemia, isn't really a leukemia. And I said, really, what is it? And they said, well, it's some sort of benign overgrowth of cells. So what, um, if this, I mean, I really thought, well, you know, this is the definition of success, that a disease that killed everybody when I was your age, you don't even think it's a leukemia anymore because the treatment is so straightforward. Um, but that treatment was derived through basically precision medicine, understanding the underlying abnormality and having a drug that can target it. Ray, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to get a little bit parochial for a moment as somebody involved with the fibrolamellar cancer community. And I know we've got members of that community on the webinar tonight. In some respects, on paper, CML and fibrolamellar have something very much in common. Each of them is driven by a fusion event that in some respect changes a protein kinase to make it a cancer driver. And so we've, we've certainly been dreaming in this fibrolamellar community that there might be a similar kind of targeted drug or targeted immune therapy perhaps that would be um, as successful in extending life for decades for what was almost a universally fatal cancer. What other examples can we point to where um, there's that sort of homogeneity in a rare cancer of a driver and it gives one the ability, even if it's a rare cancer, to really go after it with a laser focus? And, and what's the best strategy when you have that to actually try to go from the situation you described of the lethal cancer, cancer inevitably to where we are today that your fellows don't even know what the, that the, it's actually a lethal leukemia uh, with, in the absence of that magical drug. Are, are we on the verge of more magic bullets like that? Um, so the answer is absolutely yes. And we're on the verge of, um, more than one way to create a magic bullet. Um, and so um, I'll use the example of fibrolamellar cancer as an example. Um, so one way um, to create a magic bullet, um, a fibrolamellar cancer like chronic myelogenous leukemia has a specific fusion, the DNA JB1 PRKACA fusion. Um, so one way to try and target it uh, might be uh, to create a drug against that fusion. Um, we do not yet have a drug that can target that fusion. Uh, but that, that is how chronic myelogenous leukemia was uh, turned from a fatal disease to a disease that you live with by taking a couple of pills a day. Uh, for years. But something else has also happened in the field, which is equally exciting. And that's um, 
another way to attack tumors, and that's immunotherapy. And, and I have to mention this uh, because it's so powerful. Um, so in order for a tumor to exist, um, since the immune system's job is to get rid of tumors, for a tumor to exist, it often has to put the immune system to sleep. And we now have drugs that can reawaken um, the immune system. And um, uh, so I'm going to use fibrolamellar as an example uh, because um, I know of one patient um, that received immunotherapy to reawaken the immune system and was able to achieve a complete remission. We don't know if this is a one-off or maybe is more applicable, but I'm using it as an example because we have more tools in our toolbox now. So one way for fibrolamellar cancer is to try and develop a therapy that attacks the fusion. Another way might be uh, to reawaken the immune system. Now to reawaken it properly, you have to figure out what mechanism the tumor used to put it to sleep. And the tumor has lots of tricks in its bag. Um, so you have to have the right mechanism. Again, precision therapy, precision immunotherapy, but that's another way um, or another venue that we're working on to try and attack uh, tumors. Thank you, that's really helpful. Jim, maybe you could come back to, um, you, you interface with lots of patients with different rare cancers. How many of them uh, do you think today appreciate that some of these doors are at least beginning to open? to have new approaches to therapy and almost to flip the paradigm on its head that in some cases the rare cancers, because they're in some cases a little genetically more simple and more homogeneous, actually are places where advances may be made more rapidly if you can match the knowledge and the technology to these individuals who may be scattered, don't know each other well, and whose physicians initially may not realize that the advances have actually begun to open these doors. What do we do to help those individuals? Yeah, so I, you know, I think that um, very often, and, and this was certainly the experience that my family had, <clears throat> there's a certain expectation that we've come very far in cancer. And, and this is very true in a place like Boston where, where there's such a presence of cancer research in this community that exists here and, and these great institutions that, um, when somebody's diagnosed, there's there's going to be things available, um, and there's going to be treatments that that can help, basically. Um, so I know for for my family, and I know this is true for a lot of the people that we work with, it's a real shock to be told um, that that's not the case. Um, that you may be at, at you know at an MGH or a Dana Farber, um, and 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 you know here like we did that that there really aren't treatments available for for this type of cancer. So I think that oftentimes what happens, um, and of course, uh, you know, while dealing with the gravity of that, is that many, many patients in this community become incredibly knowledgeable and incredibly sophisticated about the types of things that you're talking about. Um, so, and, and in a lot of ways, that's by necessity, because there may not be that path, just like everybody's been talking about, um, just as there might be in a more common cancer, a, a path of treatment or maybe multiple treatment options to, to think about and, um, and use in succession, that might not be the case in a rare cancer. So people really do learn a lot, um, become scientific experts, um, and, and also really become advocates for themselves with their doctors and, and very often bringing the information to their doctors um, to, to push them towards a particular type of treatment or clinical trial. Um, oftentimes one of the things that's really frustrating, I think, as an advocate is when we work with the patient community, um, hearing about someone who hasn't been offered, uh, 
uh, biomarker testing or whose doctor has never talked about immunotherapy or, or any of these different options. Um, and unfortunately, I, I do think that's the reality in a lot of cases because this takes a long time to change. Um, but I'm always very encouraged and, and always excited to, to learn of all the different ways that people learn and people bring this information to their physicians um, and in a lot of ways push themselves towards treatments that may ultimately be helpful. Um, this is not the way it should be. I'm not saying that at all. Um, and, and obviously, um, it would be much better if a patient never had to do all of that work. Um, but but to answer your question, I think almost uniquely so in the communities that we work with, people people learn a tremendous amount of information. Um, they arm themselves with that information um, and they find the doctors um, in many cases who will help them to put that information to work. I think we've certainly seen a lot of the same things with the fibrolamellar community. And, and increasingly so. Um, Corey, whoop, I'm sorry. Corey, I'll ask you to help clarify uh, a question here and, and then segue from that into the work you've done on, on some of these things in your own community. Um, question is whether genomic testing is done to identify a gene mutation. Or I'm sorry, is genomic testing done to identify a gene mutation or a tumor marker or both? And we've heard the term biomarker, we've heard gene mutation. What are some of the kinds of things that actually people um, need to know about their tumors with respect to markers and genomics? Where are the overlaps? And then how did you go about actually going from a community that knew very little to one that now knows a great deal about the range of uh, variants of your cancer that are some of which are now addressable. What, what allowed that transition? Yeah, thanks for the question. And um, to clarify, and I'd love for um, any of the other panelists to jump in also with them um, to add on, and then I can segue, but just to, to clarify about genetic genomic testing um, and biomarkers, there, you know, there, there's no um, clear cut definition sometimes between the two, depending on which direction you're talking about it. So you can have a genetic mutation that is called a biomarker. And you can have biomarkers that are based on mutations, alterations, um, and differences in the underlying genomics of your tumor. But you can also have biomarkers that don't have, um, the root cause is not necessarily identified in the actual DNA of the, um, the tumor itself. And so for example, and, and I'll use this as a way to sort of segue into the, the second um, part of your question. In breast cancer, there are a bunch of different biomarkers that help um, people understand the different types of subtypes of breast cancer. And none of them are based on um, genetic mutations. They're all based on what are called, um, um, th they're all based on like how much proteins, different types of proteins people can stain for in the tissue. So they'll literally take a tumor out of somebody's breast and then what they do just, you know, for, for everybody's edification, they'll, they'll take the tumor and they'll encase it in wax and then they'll cut it into little slices. They'll take the slices and they'll stain it and then look at it under that microscope that was developed 500 years ago, as we heard about earlier. And um, depending on what the, what um, different types of stains they use, they can tell whether or not there are overrepresented proteins. And in breast cancer, some of these overrepresented proteins might help with the estrogen signaling, or they may help with, um, not help, but they may be overexpressed in a way that makes them grow um, with epidermal growth factor. And depending on which one of those types of proteins are overexpressed, th when that biomarker determines how, what type of treatments you're actually gonna have. And, um, and that's just one example from one common cancer. To segue back to the second half of your question, what we're finding, and this is reflective of, of things that we've heard already on this panel, is that even the rare cancers are, um, they can be subdivided into different subtypes. So, you know, it's not, it's, it, and it, it's really important to pay attention to this as we move forward, especially over the next five to 10 years, because I think what's gonna happen is the common cancers that are bucketed, like breast cancer into three types of breast cancer, they're really gonna be like a hundred types of cancers. 
you know, we're, as we get more biomarkers, as we understand more of the underlying genomics, as we understand the epigenetic landscape or things that happen that aren't necessarily in the DNA, but happen after things are touching the DNA, we're going to see that there are yet even more types and each one of those types will probably have different treatments. And once we get to that future inevitability, there's going to be very little difference between rare cancers and common cancers. We're all going to have to have this extensive profiling done to look at biomarkers that are either overexpressed proteins or, you know, overexpressed RNA or proteins or DNA mutations or amplifications or translocations, like all of these different types of events that can happen within the cell that are not obvious that, you know, from looking under a microscope that you need to have all this comprehensive testing for. And once we're all divided into these tiny little slices of the pie and we are molecularly defined, there's probably gonna be a sea change in the way cancer is treated more generally and the way we're all grouped together. We're gonna to probably go away from this classification based on the tissue of origin and more toward how can we find all of the people who have things like N-track fusions or all of the people who have um, fusions that like turn on this one kinase that can all be treated by the same type of drug. So with that as kind of what the future that I think we're heading toward, when I was diagnosed, I, um, I knew enough to know, like we've got to understand and learn more about angiosarcoma and the underlying genomics. And um, I took a very non-linear path to get to a position where I was able to, to do that. And that path went something like this, start off studying cancer immunology for all the reasons that we heard were really in, in interesting and important before. Um, and, and that's a whole other thing that we can talk about, but suffice it to say, that was the route I wanted to travel. Is there an impact on immuno, immuno um, uh, checkpoint inhibitors on angiosarcomas? And so I did a postdoc in that and then parlayed into a genomics position at the Broad Institute where I was able to um, develop a comprehensive uh, nationwide decentralized study where hundreds of angiosarcoma patients signed up to enable us to get those tumors that were encased in balls of wax, cut them and perform um, whole exome sequencing. And what we found was that angiosarcoma is just like almost everything you're ever gonna look at, a lot of different types of cancers, they all happen to start in an endothelial cell. So though it's not like the tissue of origin, it's the cell of origin, that is defining what angiosarcoma is. But if you look at the DNA, this angiosarcomas that arise in somebody's cutaneous area of this, the head, neck, and face is a different disease than the angiosarcoma that arose in my breast. The angiosarcoma that arises in the skin is caused by a different manifestation than the one that started in my breast. The skin angiosarcomas are caused, and for the most part, it's not 100%, but for the most part, they're caused by UV radiation from the sun. And it's really interesting um, if it wasn't so devastating, when you actually look at the DNA inside of a cutaneous angiosarcoma tumor, there is a signature in the way that the mutations arise. Meaning that if you look at the, you know, the A, T, C, and G, the way that they cluster together and the way that the mutations arise create what's called a signature. And you can read that signature out and the signature says, I was caused by UV radiation. And you can see that in these cutaneous angiosarc tumors. You don't see that in angiosarcomas that arise anywhere else in the body. As a result of those um, di intrinsic differences in the site of origin of these um, angiosarcomas, there are different treatments that you can actually administer to patients that have differential effects. Those are actually being studied right now in, in clinical trials that use the data that we were able to generate, but they're showing that these angiosarcomas that start in the cutaneous region of people's um, you know, sun exposed areas are responsive to checkpoint inhibitors, whereas angiosarcomas like mine in the breast may be sensitive to PIK3CA inhibitors because that was one of the genes that was highly mutated in the breast angiosarcomas. And so by detailing the underlying genomics, of a ton of angiosarcoma patients, we were able to identify a bunch of different types and subtypes that may be able to be differentially targeted. And we're working to do, um, to study those clinically right now. Mark, I think you have a couple of questions. In the yeah. Q &A, yeah. Right, thank you. Um, I'd like to actually take one of those questions and use it to uh, ask a question for Ray. Um, We've heard 
that we're still at the beginning of the having the ability to match better treatments to the precision diagnostics that we get by looking at DNA, or in some cases, the combination of DNA and, and proteins in the cell. Um, one of the areas that, as you pointed out, has been revolutionary over the last 10 to 15 years has been the introduction of immune therapy. And here you have something which is really pretty remarkable that it's not targeted in most cases exactly at the genetic abnormality in the tumor, but it is something that um, awakens a response to many kinds of tumors based on the fact that they have mutations of different kinds. Where are we in being able to figure out why the immune system is being shut off in a more precise way and individualizing that recognition so that we can expand from uh, occasional, uh, you know, 30%, 50%, sometimes a little higher responses, which are sometimes very dramatic responses, but what do we do for the other 50 or 60 or 70% of people who aren't responding now? And, and how do we actually begin to subdivide and understand what mechanisms the tumor is using to suppress the immune system and treat on that basis? Yeah, so this is a whole other revolution uh, that is um, really amazing that has occurred. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I'm going to use the angiosarcomas just as a preliminary example. Uh, Corey uh, uh, put together uh, an amazing database of all these angiosarcomas, and you can see the differences between uh, patients. And um, there's a subset of patients that have what we call a higher mutational burden. They have more mutations. Um, and uh, we now know that those are the patients that are more sensitive to immunotherapy. And that's not just true for angiosarcoma. Uh, that's really true across the board. So um, it, this is kind of amazing because um, for targeted therapy, like for chronic myelogenous leukemia, the reason the targeted therapy works so well is because there's one abnormality. And you hit that one abnormality, if you hit it on the head, you get a patient that can have a normal lifespan. But if I go back um, uh, to the beginning of next generation sequencing, 2012, 2013, 2014, we began to see these patients, they didn't have one abnormality, they had a lot of mutations. And we kind of used to hang our heads and be really sad about those patients uh, because those were the patients that even I said, we will never be able to treat them. Like, how do you treat a patient that has 50 abnormalities? You can't give them 50 drugs. So we were really sad. Um, and that was, um, those were the patients that, you know, we're just never going to be able to treat them. So just like with genomic sequencing, never was over, but this time it didn't take uh, decades, it was over in about uh, three or four years. So it turns out that if a tumor has a lot of mutations, um, it has to put the immune system to sleep in order to exist. Because what, a, what I said before, that the immune system's job is to get rid of things that are abnormal, whether it be bacteria or viruses or tumor cells that are chock full of mutations. Now, if a tumor cell only has one mutation, the immune system has some trouble differentiating it from normal tissue. And the job of the immune system is not to attack your normal tissue. But if a tumor is has 50 or 100 mutations, that tumor cell to exist has put the immune system to sleep. And now it's our job to see what trick has the tumor cell used to put the immune system to sleep. Now the tumor has a lot of tricks up its sleeve, but one of the common tricks are molecules called PD-1, PD-L1. And we've now discovered um, ways, drugs, 
that um, can attack that PD-1, PD-L1, which sort of puts the immune system to sleep and inactivate that particular mechanism. And the amazing thing is, who would be the best responders? Those patients that we used to hang our heads about. Um, so the patient that has 50 or 100 mutations that we thought we could never treat, once we figured out how to reawaken the immune system with drugs that are anti-PD, they're called checkpoint inhibitors, um, uh, the higher the number of the mutations, the better the response. In fact, patients that don't have a lot of mutations, and there's exceptions to this rule, but they're likely not to respond as well. But once you awaken the immune system and you have 50 or 100 mutations, those T cells, that immune system is saying, oh, that tumor doesn't belong there, that's messed up. That, I, you know, I'm talking for the T cells, but I imagine that's what they're saying. Uh, that tumor, that is completely messed up. That doesn't look like anything normal. I'm getting rid of that. So those tumor, those patients went from being the worst that even I thought, um, if you asked me in 2014, would they be treatable? I would say never. And then uh, we had our first dramatic response in uh, October, 2015. We had a patient uh, that came to us with end-stage disease, liver, brain, bone metastases, uh, next step hospice. He had 79 mutations per megabase. That's a lot of mutations. And uh, we treated him with a checkpoint inhibitor and that was October, 2015. We're now six and a half years later, he's still in complete remission. And he's not a one-off. Um, I think all of us as physicians now have a stable of patients and they're usually patients with these high mutational burden that um, uh, are in not partial remissions, not a remission that lasts a year or two, but remissions that have lasted for years. And um, I think as an oncologist, I'm afraid of the word cure. I'm supposed to be cautious, but I think they're cured. Um, so I, that's just one example. There's a lot more testing that we can do now, like we can figure out the mechanism that the tumor uses to put the immune system to sleep. We have more drugs with a hit a variety of checkpoints, but that's just one of example of, of going a completely different route. Rather than attacking the mutations, we reactivate the immune system, completely different route. Thanks, Ray. It's illuminating. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time. I ask those of you in the audience who may have a final question, please get it up there rapidly so we we don't uh, end before we get to answer. And use the Q and A, please, not the chat function for that. Um, I'll take just one second to amplify on something that Ray just said. There was a thrilling report recently, last couple of weeks actually, of a clinical trial on a relatively small number of patients in which 12 out of 12 patients who were valuable not only responded to one of these so-called checkpoint inhibitors, a new one that's just in the clinic, but actually completely went into remission um, in a trial where it was expected they would probably just be getting that immune treatment as a lead-in to surgery or to radiation. And not one of those 12 required anything other than the checkpoint inhibitor. What they had in common was that they were in that category that Ray just described of having actually a gene mutation that caused the cell to make lots and lots more mutations. It was a, a defect in repairing DNA. And that category of cancer has gone now to possibly be super treatable. In the case of a cancer like, again, the one we think about, fibrolamellar, where you have one main driver and you don't have that background, where you're at the complete opposite end of the spectrum of immune uh, signals being put out because of random mutations or um, 
inaccuracies that the cancer cell is particularly prone to suffer from. So what do we do? What we're trying to do actually, and this work from a group at Johns Hopkins, is to immunize very specifically against the one abnormality that we know that those tumor cells have and combine that with the drugs that reawaken the immune system. So there are strategies at both ends of the spectrum if you have something that you can get the immune system to target. But that, that whole area. So what we've really heard today is that both with drugs that attack the underlying biochemical mechanism of cancer or drugs that attack the immune defenses that cancers put up and, and probably many others, the, the jump from understanding the cancer at the DNA level and at the level of what it's doing to, in its talking to the immune system to actually having precise individual therapies is, is uh, something we're approaching faster and faster. And we're, as Ray said, we're not there yet, but we're getting closer every day. So I'd like to just throw it open if, if Jim, Corey, or Ray have a last remark you'd like to make, and otherwise I'm not seeing any more questions. We'll, we'll thank people for their attention. But quickly, just around, Jim, do you, any last thought? Uh, j just to say thank you for for having me as a part of this and you know uh, and also thank you for the work that you and John are doing you know I, I think what <clears throat> you know going back to what we talked about at the beginning um, it takes so much work to get to this understanding um, and it's so important to have people represent representing every type of rare cancer um, and I'm certainly grateful for the work that you're all doing and grateful to be a part of this uh, great panel tonight so thank you. Yeah, I want to share my gratitude as well. Um, I think that this is such an important topic. It's rapidly evolving. And so though we have insights now and though we're able to match people to different therapies, I, I, it's just we're on this like exponential curve right now. We're right at the inflection point. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it moving forward. And we're going to get a lot more stories like we heard out of ASCO um, uh, with this uh, colon cancer trial that that just came online. So I'm really excited for, for things to come both as a patient and a scientist. Thanks, Corey. And Ray, I'd like to get the last word. Um, so I think that it's important um, to know, um, I want to reemphasize the TRAC trial. Um, uh, what Jim started through the Target Cancer Foundation is a trial uh, that will approve 400 patients. Uh, I think there's probably about 150 that have consented to the uh, trial. But this is the poster child for uh, individualized therapy trial. So everybody gets uh, genomic sequencing. Um, and then uh, that is examined by um, an expert molecular tumor board and furthermore, patients don't have to travel uh, because that is, um, I think, um, a really big deal if you have to travel halfway around the country uh, when you're sick. Um, so they can get on the trial from at home and get the sequencing and get the advice of the molecular tumor board. And I can tell you, at the molecular tumor board because uh, I'm part of it. Uh, we look at every patient as an individual and we try to uh, determine uh, what would be the best individualized therapy uh, for that patient. Uh, so I hope TRAC becomes a poster child for uh, the way uh, clinical trials will be conducted in the future uh, has all the ingredients, the genomic sequencing, the individualized therapy, and th the patient gets to stay at home. Uh, so Jim, thank you for, for, for leading the way with that trial. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And, and certainly for anyone who might be interested in the trial, um, you can learn more on our website at targetcancerfoundation.org slash track um, or uh, Mark or John certainly know how to find me if anyone would like to be connected. Yeah, we do. Thanks, Jim. Listen, I, I we have um, run through the time we allotted and, and I'm just so grateful to our panelists and to John for helping us to organize this. We have three more webinars planned on the same general topic of precision medicine 
and rare cancers. The next is going to be on September 29th. and uh, happens to be the eve of Rare Cancer Day, September 30th. And we'll talk about other aspects of, of how we apply um, precision medicine to rare cancers, particularly what we're calling functional precision medicine or functional genomic kind of testing. We'll have another on how we follow DNA in patients and what's so-called uh, circulating tumor DNA and related technologies. And finally, uh, and that will be sometime probably the first week of November, and then in early December, we'll talk about some of the efforts that are being made to make more drugs and different kinds of drugs to bring the treatment paradigms closer in sync with our increased understanding of what causes cancer. So we we'll hope to have some of the same panelists at, at at least a couple of these events, and I hope some of the same audience members, and thank you all for your attention. Take care. John, can I give you the yeah, one, one last thing again. Last goodbye. A, sp a special thank you again to Ray, Jim, and Corey for being on this. this is tremendous. Jim, thank you for making sure people understand how to get into the track program, which is fantastic. Uh, special thanks to Kurt Losart and Lynn O'Malley also who have helped put this together. And I would just encourage anybody on this, you know, we do want to hear from you. That the voice of the patient, the carrier in particular is very important. So feel free to email us. You can see on our website ways to get in touch with us, info at fibrofoundation.org, or you can uh, email Kurt, you know, Mark, myself, it's just our first initial last name, Jay Hopper at Fibro Foundation, same for, for Mark and Kurt. But we do want to hear from you in terms of, in this topic particularly, other questions you may have, it helps to formulate what we put together in the future. So this is a collaborative effort. We want to hear from you. And again, thanks everybody for being part of this. And uh, hopefully we'll see more of you on the 29th of September. Take care all. <laughs>